Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grace. Great to see you. Um, we're going to start this morning off with worship, so if you could rise, whether you are here or on your couch or wherever. Um, and we're focusing on Philippians, um, and one of the verses I want to read is Philippians 1.27. Uh, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Uh, so as I was preparing for worship this week, um, it made me think Paul talks about not being frightened by our opponents. Um, so I, I was thinking, what, what might we be afraid of? Um, and how do we stand firm with courage? And I think one of the ways we do that is through worship. Um, so that's something to reflect on as we come to God and bring him praise.
morning, everybody. I'd just like to say a short blessing for all of our children. In Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 7, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Jesus, we just thank you so much for these children. We ask, Lord, that you would guide us as we teach them about you and who you are, as we impress on their hearts your incredible love and mercy and grace toward all of us. Amen. All right. Now, this is something that I keep in my car at all times because you just never know when there could be an emergency. I want to be prepared for everything. So I've got Band-Aids. I've got gloves, I've got wipes, I've got tape, I've got tweezers in case somebody gets a splinter. Basically, the point of this kit is to be prepared for anything, like absolutely anything. Today, we're going to learn about how to keep our hearts stocked with all of the things that we need to be prepared for him. I'll see you in Kids Church. Bye. morning, Grace. Uh, this morning as I was driving to church, uh, the song um, that was playing was, Even the Impossible is Possible with You. And if you're reading along um, in the one-year Bible with us, God has been asking the Israelites for their first fruits, for the first offspring, for the first lamb, as he over and over does the impossible right before their eyes. I was also listening this week um, to a couple that was being interviewed, and um, they were $200,000 in debt, and um, they turned that around and are now on their feet and doing very well. And one of the questions that the guy interviewing asked them was, why did you continue to tithe um, when you were $200,000 in debt and, and continue to now? And they said, because God can do more with 10% than we can do with the 90. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? Amen. God can do more with the 10% than we can do with the 90 because God can make the impossible possible. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you uh, that you are that God. That you are the God that you say you are, that you keep your promises. Lord, we bring um, our first roots to you. We thank you for the way that um, you can make uh, these first streets work uh, for your kingdom. Uh, we ask that uh, that light spread. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Oh, the ushers could come, please. Um, and you can stand um, as we continue our worship. Um, I've been doing a a worship devotional and something that stood out to me that the author said um, he said why do we worship um, some and some people think oh I didn't get anything out of that worship and are we worshiping to get something out of it or are we worshiping um, to give something to God and the author of this um, devotional uh, says that God could show you anything as you reflect and listen to him God showed me in worship that the something that's of worth was me, was all of us worshiping him at that moment. We are valuable, and we bless God's heart. Um, so as we sing this next song, um, know that you are valuable and that you can bless God's heart through your worship.
about
Father God, we thank you that we can stand faultless before the throne, uh, not because of anything that we've done, but because of what you've done for us. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son to die for us. We thank you that um, we can have hope in that. We thank you that we can be grounded in that. Um, and we pray that we would um, be united with you. Um, and we pray that as Pastor Rich preaches to us today, that our ears would be open to hear and our hearts would be open to change in what you have in store for us. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat, everyone. Thank you, band. We appreciate you. Thanks for leading us and serving us. Good morning, church. Last week when Chuck was up front leading worship, he said that he wasn't perfect. And he said that the church wasn't perfect. And because I want to follow that pattern of authenticity, I need to tell you that it's very lonely being the only perfect person here. Um, in fact, you know that's not true. I made a mistake last week in my teaching from up front here that I have to correct today. I have to um, uh, add something that I was thinking but didn't actually say. I don't know if that ever has happened to you. You're thinking something and you think you said it and then you realize later you didn't. And this was pretty critical. So let me just add, last week, as I was talking about this phrase, to live is Christ and to die is gain, I said live equals Christ, die equals gain. And when I said, was talking about die equals gain, I mentioned that uh, dying always feels like loss to me. I felt like I lost my parents, I lost uh, Heidi's dad. And what I was thinking in my mind that I didn't say was, for those of us on this side, death is loss. Death is not gain. We lose. The people who move on, they're the ones who gain because they're going to be with Christ. And I wanted to make sure that you were clear that that's what I meant. Uh, I'm assuming that you cut me enough slack to know that's what I meant. I was not trying to teach you that we should be um, looking at death on this side um, and not be sad, because it is sad for us when we say goodbye to people and they move on. When Paul was saying death is gain, we could agree that death is gain for us when we move on to be with Christ. It's okay to be sad and feel the loss when people move on from here, but also to be happy for those we know who go on to be with Christ. So I just wanted to correct that, and I'm sorry I shattered your perception of me that I'm not perfect. Um, I'm about as close as you can get, but not quite there. Uh, last week I also said there was a verse in the section that we were reading that I wanted to come back to today. It was verse 19 from Philippians chapter 1, and that verse said that, Paul was saying, I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Christ, what happened will turn out for my deliverance. And I said, this is going to be an important verse for us here at Grace Church, so I want to spend a little time on it today. So we're going to open our Bibles. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, grab a pew Bible. They're in the rack right in front of you. If you brought your Bible with you today, um, I'm still checking. Hold it up. Let's see it. All right. I've seen a couple new ones. I've seen a couple old battered ones. Um, Nice Bible. Thank you for holding that one up. At home, I hope you're holding yours up too. Um, we're going to open to the book of Philippians. It's a New Testament letter from the Apostle Paul to the Philippian church. And um, in case you're flipping there and trying to figure out where it is, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those are the four Gospels. Then the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And then Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians. Uh, if you followed all that, if you're in a pew Bible and you need a page number, I'm on page 951, if our pew Bibles match. So we're going to read uh, chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Rebecca read almost all of that from the piano earlier, so these words should sound familiar. And then after I make a few comments about it, we're going to go back to that other verse I mentioned. So here, let's just read. It starts like this in verse 27. Whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you will stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. 
Now, you might not pick up immediately from this section of verses what I want to share with you today, uh, but uh, there's a mouthful in there. And what's really striking to me are the similarities between the Philippian church 2,000 years ago and Grace Church today. So what I'd like to do is, I'd like to describe the situation in the Philippian church that Paul's referring to in this passage. And I'd like you to just listen with one ear toward what it was like for the Philippian church and the other ear toward what it's like here at Grace Church today and see if you can find any similarities between the two. Because I think it's amazing that in this time in the life of Grace Church, God has led us to open the book of Philippians. There's so much that God wants to say to us in this as a church. So we open our ears, we open our hearts, we open our minds, and we say, Holy Spirit, speak to us. We're here in this place to hear from you and to learn from you. And uh, take this time now, Lord, and teach us. So this was the situation in the Philippian church. Paul was their leader. Paul was their founder. Paul's the one who converted the first people who started the church in Philippi. He was actually their first pastor, if you think about it. And he was hugely influential and dearly loved by these people. He was part of their family, part of the Philippian family, and he was gone. He was being held in prison. They were without Paul. They were without their leader, their founder, their first pastor. In fact, I suspect from my reading and studying of Philippians, they didn't have a pastor at this time in the life of their church when Paul was writing to them. They were pastorless. They were leaderless. Yes, there were leaders in the church who were stepping up and trying to keep things going and make things happen, but the church in, in Philippi at the time of this writing didn't have a pastor and Paul, whom they dearly loved and looked to as their leader, was gone. He said he, would, he was hoping for his deliverance and he wanted to come back, but they didn't know when or if he was even coming. They were in this waiting place saying, How long, Lord? When will you bring us our leader? How long do we have to wait? How many times do we have to pray? How many times do we have to ask you while we wait for you to send us Paul or some other leader who can help us lead our church? Any of that sound familiar to Grace Church today? They had another thing going on. There were actually two struggles in the Philippian church. One was they felt kind of leaderless. They were doing their best, but they really wanted their pastor. The second thing that was a struggle for the Philippian church was an internal struggle, that there were fractures in the church. The church was pretty stable. It had grown to a point where it had some history. And it had some stability, and it had some respect, and it was doing a good work. But there were some internal fractures that were starting to open cracks within the church. If we flip our page in Philippians, I'm going to flip mine one page to Philippians chapter 4, we jump ahead. Right in the first couple verses of Philippians chapter 4, if you've flipped yours, I'm going to start in verse 2. Paul writes this to the Philippian church. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Sintichi to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers who name, whose names are in the book of life. Paul was saying there are two women in the church and they're influential women, they're leaders. He said, in fact, they worked side by side with me. These were good women who loved the church and who loved God and were trying to, to help the church move forward, but they were in a disagreement with each other. And they were butting heads over who knows what. And people were starting to take up sides. Oh, I agree with Yodia. I agree with Sintichi. And it was creating a fracture in the church. And Paul said, I plead with you. I beg you. I urge you, women, please, for the good of the church. Set aside your disagreement. Some of the versions might read like this. Yours might read, I urge you to agree in the Lord. Does anyone's version say that, in the Lord? The one I just read says it slightly differently, in the Lord. What does it mean to agree in the Lord? It means that you might not agree on your issue, but you can agree that you'll disagree on your issue, but you're going to agree in the Lord. That means you're going to set your disagreement aside. You're going to stop taking your claws out. You're going to stop fighting with each other, and for the good of the family, you're going to agree together to disagree, to say this is an issue we disagree on, 
But we can still be sisters, we can still be brothers, we can still worship together, and we can still try to move the church forward. This was the issue in the Philippian church. Two issues. They felt leaderless, they were waiting for their pastor, and they had some internal struggles as they were going through this waiting period. Does that sound familiar? Raise your hand if that sounds familiar. How about at home? Familiar? Yeah. Yeah. That is amazing to me that that was the struggle of the church. And it's not uncommon. It's the struggle of many churches through the history of the story of the church. Typically, there are two forces that come against any church. Grace Church, any church that exists in the United States or in the world today, any church that has existed or will exist, there are two main forces that come against it. And I know you're thinking evil and Satan. I'm thinking of a different way to describe the forces. The one is persecution. Persecution is a powerful force that comes against the church. It comes from the outside. It's when outside pressures and outside forces try to stop what the church is doing. And every church that's trying to advance the gospel is going to face some form of pushback some kind of persecution. The Philippian church felt that pushback from the outside, like Grace Church does. As we try to bring the gospel outside of these walls, we get pushback, whether you're doing it personally in your life or the church is doing it corporately, there's pushback. But there's levels of persecution. Around the world, there's much worse than pushback. There are Christians losing their lives for their faith. Persecution is that force that comes against the church from the outside. And it typically has the end result of unifying the church and making it stronger. Isn't that funny? That when, the, when persecution comes against the church, that's usually when the church abroad, the church at large, flourishes most. When there's no pushback, when there's very little persecution, when things are good and easy, that's when the church gets weak and lazy. So persecution is the force that comes against the church from the outside. There's another force, and I actually think it's the more dangerous one, that comes against almost every church, and that's struggles from the inside. When churches have infighting, and I'm not just talking about here at Grace. It happened at the church I pastored for 25 years. It happens in so many churches. I used to say that um, Satan puts itching dust on Christians so they start to irritate each other. That's how it starts. And then we hold grudges. And then we don't forgive. And then churches split. I've been in a couple of churches that have split. It's an awful thing when Christians get to the point where they disagree so much they can't even be in the same room together. That's a force that comes from inside. And that's the one that makes the church fracture and crumble. Forces from the outside make the church stronger usually, and fractures from the inside are usually what kill and weaken it. And this was some of the tension that the Philippian church was feeling. This is some of what they were going through. This is why Paul wrote to them, let's go back now to verse 27, with a little bit of that understanding in mind. Let's look back at verse 27 and read again what Paul wrote. So open your Bible back up if you flipped it closed, if you had your finger in there, part those pages back open. If you're swiping through your phone... Come back to verse 27. Whatever happens, what Paul means by that is, whether I come or not come, whether it takes a short time or a long time, whatever happens next, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Paul recognized you're in a hard spot, Philippian church. You're waiting for a leader, and you're you're dealing with some internal struggles. Whatever's going on and whatever happens next, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. The wording of that can give us the wrong way to look at it. Because what we do with the word worthy, at least what I do, what I do with the word worthy, when someone says to me, you live worthy, I feel like i got to be good. I have to deserve it. It means if I'm going to live worthy of the gospel, I've got to deserve the gospel. I've got to live in a way that says, I deserve the gospel. That's not the gospel. <laughs> so what does this mean, live worthy of the gospel? The gospel is a message of grace. So the wording here, it, it makes sense like this. Live in keeping with the gospel. 
That means extend a lot of grace to each other. It means live lives of grace. It means extend forgiveness lavishly and mercy, and mercy lavishly. Live in a manner in keeping with the gospel, Paul said. Whatever happens next, whatever happens in your day-to-day life, live out the gospel. The gospel is, I deserve punishment and I didn't get it. God loves me and forgives me because he loves me and forgives me, not because I deserve it. And God promises to stand by me no matter what. He'll never leave me or forsake me. So if I'm going to live in a manner in keeping with the gospel, then I've got to be that way with everyone else. I've got to be loving and and kind and merciful and forgiving and promise to stand by people no matter what. That's how we live worthy of the gospel. And I want you to notice that the word yourselves here that Paul used is plural. He's speaking to the Philippian church as a family. He's saying, live together in a manner worthy of the gospel. Live together in keeping with the gospel of grace, he's saying to the Philippian church. Whatever happens, whether I come back soon or never come back at all, live together in unity. Let's keep reading. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. What he's saying here is, if you as a church, Philippi, Philippian church, stand in unity in the gospel, you don't have to be afraid about what comes against you because it will mean destruction for them and salvation for you. Just what I described. When persecution comes against the church from the outside, it makes us stand firm in unity, and the outside can't win. Jesus said the the outside will never defeat his church. The way to defeat the church is to kill it from the inside. And Satan knows that, and he tries to make that happen. Here's what Paul said to the Galatian church in a verse in the book of Galatians. He said, the entire law is filled in this one command, love your neighbor as yourselves. We've heard that before, right? But the rest of that verse, this is what he says. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. What Paul is saying to the Galatian church too is if you chew each other up and spit each other out, it's going to kill the church. But if you love one another and stand together in unity, nothing can stop the church. Nothing. No force. That was Paul's message to the Galatian church. It was Paul's message to the Philippian church. And if Paul could stand here and say it to the Grace Church, he'd say the same thing. Um, So how do you stand together in unity? Now let's go back to that verse 19 that I mentioned last week. So I don't know if you have to flip your page or just skim back. Chapter 1 of the book of Philippians, verse 19. Let's read that one together. Paul writes this. I know that through your prayers... And God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me, will turn out for my deliverance. Paul was hoping to be delivered from prison, and he was basing that hope on two things, two factors, two elements, the prayers of the church and the power of the Holy Spirit. The prayers of the church and the power of the Holy Spirit. How do you stand together as a church, whether it's Grace Church or the Philippian Church or the church I used to pastor or any other church in this world? How do you stand together in unity? It's praying together in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's saying that we're never going to agree about everything, ever. We're people. But we can agree in the Lord to stand together in prayer with the Holy Spirit. There's something about prayer and the Holy Spirit. God has just made it this way. It's like when those two things come together, it's like an atomic bomb spiritually. It's like the Holy Spirit is gasoline and our prayers are the match. And boom, we create an explosion. If you want a nicer picture, we could say this. It's like the Holy Spirit is vinegar and the prayers are baking soda. Not quite as powerful, but not as ugly looking as gasoline, right? Or the Holy Spirit is water and our prayers are dry ice. Nah, that one doesn't work really either. How about when the prayers of the people of God come together with the power of the Holy Spirit, watch out evil. Watch out darkness because power is happening. That's how God's people stand together. We do it in prayer with the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that himself. I'm going to have you flip back 
several pages now to the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. If you're navigating your, navigating your way through the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. I'm going to read verse 13 through 17 in the Pew Bible. If you have that, I'm on page 875. I'll give you a second to get there because I really want you to hear what Jesus said. This was in his final prayer for his disciples, the ones who were alive and following him in his day. And he said this prayer is not just for them, but all those who will follow them. So this is about us too. And this is what he writes. I want you to listen for prayer and the Holy Spirit in Jesus' words here. Verse 13, 13, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Sounds like prayer. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. So Jesus is saying here, there are two things I want all the people who follow me to pay attention to. In their obedience to me, I want them to bring their prayers to me, and I am going to combine that with the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's how the kingdom of God advances. So I would like us to practice that today. I'd like to take the rest of the time that I usually would teach and have us pray uh, together. We're going to pray in the room and pray at home. And I know it might be hard to hear each other, those who are at home and those in the room, but that doesn't matter. We can still pray in unity. We can still pray together. We can still pray knowing that the family of Grace Church is praying here in the room and at various other rooms. And I'm going to give us some structure to help us praying. We're good to go on that? Oops, I clicked too many times. That was me. You may have heard of the Acts of Prayer. It's been around for a long time. A-C-T-S is the acronym. Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. And we're going to take a couple of minutes in each of these categories. I'll lead us through. We'll start with adoration. Then we'll have a little bit of time of confession, time of saying thank you to God. And then the supplication is when we bring our requests to him. And uh, we'll pray together here in the room, here at home. At home also, you can write your prayers in the chat box if you would like them to be seen and read and have other people agree with your prayer. Here in the room and here at home, pray out loud if you're comfortable. Pray silently. Don't worry about whether the people around you can or can't hear you. But we're going to start now with adoration. So how do you adore someone? You adore someone by telling them the things about them that you admire. So the way we adore God is we say, God, you're amazing. God, you're, you're so faithful. God, you're powerful, miraculous, loving, kind. Some of the best ways to get started adoring God is by just using single words. So I'm going to have a scripture verse up here or two for each category to help you focus. You can read those through if you'd like. Close your eyes, open your eyes, kneel, stand, sit, whatever you want to do. But what we're going to do together for a couple minutes now is we're just going to adore God. And I'll throw some prayers in, you can hear through the microphone. And you say yours here, you say yours at home. And together we stand in unity and prayer in the power of the Holy Spirit. God, we adore you. And sometimes we don't know how to do that, so let, let's just start with simple words. God, you are all-powerful. Mighty. Yeah. Hey, don't worry if your prayers overlap. God can separate those. He's amazing. Forgetting. Kind. And you can stretch your single words into phrases and sentences. God, I don't know what I would do without you in my life.
The Bible says there are created beings that stand around the throne of God, and all they do all day long, day after day, is say, holy, holy, holy. Now, we might get tired of saying that, but it just strikes me that God must be so holy that it takes that long to describe it. God, you are holy, holy, holy. Say it with her. Holy. You are you. Holy, holy, holy. Holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty.
Do you believe that? In your heart, in your eyes, is God beautiful to you? Tell him so. Tell him so. And hey, try this. Tell God he's holy. And not just one time, but three times. I think there's something transformational in that. When we tell God he's holy, holy, holy. Say it out loud three times, right on your own. Holy, holy, holy you are, God. You are. You know, when you come out of the darkness into light, you start to see things you didn't see before because it was dark. You didn't notice or recognize, but when you come into the light, you start to see some things. And the closer you draw to the light, the more you see. It's like that with God's holiness is that we think we're okay until we start to draw into the holiness of God, and then we realize we have cracks and imperfections and sin, and um, the closer we get to God, the more we see that. And so the next part of what we're going to do is called confession, and confession is just honestly owning up to the truth that God is holy and I'm not on my own. He makes me holy, he calls me a saint, but I know I start out as a sinner. And I know I fall back into sinful ways and sinful thoughts and I have sinful words and I hurt other people's feelings and I do things wrong and I wish I could undo some things and all those things come into my mind when I start to draw into the presence of God. But he said, don't be afraid of that. He'll forgive us if we come to him honestly. So take some time and you may want to confess silently. You may want to confess out loud. But all God says is, confess. Don't hide. That's what Eve and Adam tried to do on their first sin. They just tried to hide. And God says, don't hide. I've got you covered. I shed blood for you. And that blood will wash you clean and make you holy if you just come to me. The psalmist said, blessed is the one, some versions say happy is the one, whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Happy is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. What that no deceit means is we come to him honestly and we say, God, I've sinned. God, I sin when I compare myself to others because I always want to feel like I'm a little smarter, a little better. And I can be really prideful, God, and judgmental. Forgive me. God, I sin when I don't give you your due, when I go through my whole day and make all my own decisions and think only of me and don't submit myself to you. Forgive me. And God, I don't just sin with my attitudes, I sin with my mouth the words that come out. Blessings and cursings can come from the same tongue. First John 1 John 1.9 in the New Testament, it says this, and I hang on to this promise, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and he's justified and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That if we confess our sins, it's a big two-letter word, if we confess our sins, God is faithful 
He'll forgive us and not just forgive us, wash us clean again, purify us from our unrighteousness and our sin. Hey, Grace family, what's more unifying than these two things? We come into God's presence together and worship and adore him and tell him how wonderful and amazing he is. And together we confess our sins and say, without God, we are hopelessly lost. Without Jesus and the cross and his love and his grace and his mercy, there's not a one of us that can stand before God and boast. What's more unifying than that, to stand together before God and say, we need you. We need you. And when we really realize what God is offering us, forgiveness and mercy, and lavish us with grace, how can we not say thank you? Let's say thank you. This is the Thanksgiving part. I was looking for a psalm that would remind us to give Thanksgiving, and I found so many of them I had a hard time choosing one. This one, Psalm 100, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Come into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. What do you have to thank him for today? Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Jesus, for promising to never leave me or forsake me. So I've said before, it's one level to feel grateful. It's another level to say thank you. So you got to say it. It doesn't matter whether I can hear you or anyone else can hear you here at home. God hears it when you say it. Say thank you. (laughs) Sound like my mother. Say thank you. Then there's this great verse in Philippians we haven't gotten to yet, but we will, that says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. That God invites us to bring our requests to him. He invites us to ask for things, to ask for help. Together, we stand in unity as a family here at Grace, and we ask him for help. So we're going to move to this section that's called supplication. And together, we're going to ask God to help us with our needs. God, help us as a family to live and conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Help me in my part to live in keeping with the gospel of grace. Help me to love Help me to forgive. Help me to agree in the Lord. Help me not to hold a grudge. What's your prayer today? What would you ask him? Now's your time. What would we ask them together? God, help our search committee. Help them make good decisions. Help them have great conversations. Help them find the right person. 
What's our prayer today for our search committee? Lord God, this church wants a pastor full time, a shepherd and a leader. You know just the right person and the right timing. Help us in this waiting place to wait well and to pray. And Holy Spirit, move. Move, move circumstances, move mountains, move hearts, move the mail, move correspondence. Prepare us and them. Grace Church, what's our prayer for this? Are you praying? When we pray and the Holy Spirit moves, look out evil. Move back darkness. You can't stop us. Our part is praying. We've got to light the match. Grace, what do you want, I mean, God, what do you want us here at Grace Church to do in this community, to be? How can we reach out? Lord, how can we reach people with your love and the gospel of grace? Help us to love our neighbors and our community. Help us to serve you well. Lord God, grow us. Jesus' disciples once said that Jesus increased our faith. Jesus, increase our faith. What's your prayer today? The psalmist said, hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call and my heart grows faint. Lead me to that rock that's higher than I. Jesus said this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Knock today, Grace Church. Knock. And if you don't know what to ask, ask God, what should I ask? And the Holy Spirit will help you. God, I thank you for this body of Christ. It's so, so, so the picture of your kingdom. There are people here, Lord Jesus, men and women, children from different tribes, different nations, all together in you. Lord Jesus, you have blessed this community of believers with different colors of skin and different 
whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Lord, we stand together in awe of you. We stand in awe of you. And now, Grace family, go walk in his power and in the power of the Holy Spirit this week. God bless you. Amen.